This is going to be Galatians chapter number 3. And we're going to talk about the subject of, are you working hard to get to the third heaven? The Galatians had been saved, but now they were deceived into thinking they had to keep themselves saved. They believed they were saved by grace through faith without works, but then they thought they had to have works to keep it. So Paul says in Galatians 3, 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? Yes, you have been bewitched if someone has made you think that you can keep yourself saved by your own goodness and work after you're saved to make sure that you get to the third heaven. Paul knew somebody had to have came in to bewitch the Galatians. A false teacher had came in, had them under a spell. 2 Corinthians 11.15 tells us that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, and they will bewitch you. And there is no such thing as a good witch. Some preacher said, the only good witch is a sandwich. And I found that to be true. Especially if you didn't make it yourself. It always tastes better if somebody else made it. But that's the only good witch. It's not even a good witch on the TV show bewitched. But the Galatians, they were bewitched and the Galatians are being foolish. It's a foolish thought to think that we can earn our salvation or keep our salvation. If we could, then Jesus Christ had died in vain. If you could keep it, then why couldn't you earn it as well? In Galatians 2.21, it said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But righteousness does not come by the law. It comes by Jesus Christ. Notice Paul said that you should not obey the truth to the Galatians. They had been bewitched, and it made them not obey the truth. They were not obeying the doctrine that Paul taught them. This is proof they were bewitched. To disobey is rebellion. Remember what Samuel said back in 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23? And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat, fat of rams. For rebellion... <clears throat> <clears throat> is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. They were not obeying the gospel. The Galatians were saved, but after they got saved, they were teaching a false gospel and believing one. They had been bewitched. They were in rebellion to Paul's gospel. The Galatians were obviously saved, but they had their doctrine messed up. They were bewitched and foolish. And those are two characteristics of somebody that's trying to either work their way to the third heaven or think that they're keeping themselves saved by works to make it to the third heaven. Bewitched and foolish. Even after Paul had preached the cross to them so clearly, he had the marks of the Lord Jesus in his body. In the same epistle... Paul speaks of this. In Galatians six seventeen. he says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 4, 9 and 10, Paul said, Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And I believe this is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, he says to the Galatians, Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. How did the Galatians see Jesus Christ crucified among them? They saw Paul living a crucified life and literally bearing in his body the marks. The Galatians may not have been at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but they still saw him. They saw him through the preaching of Paul, through Paul's example. For example, it says something about Moses in Hebrews 11.27 that would shed light on this. And in that verse, it said, By faith he forsook Egypt, 
not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So the apostle Paul was so Christ-like that he placed the cross of Jesus Christ right in front of the eyes of the Galatians, and they see him who is invisible. And Paul also says in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. That should be every Christian's desire is for people to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I know there have been plenty of times where my pastor, Donnie Dalton, has been preaching on, on the cross, and it's like you can just see Jesus Christ crucified. And he made sin plain, and, and it made, he made it very evident that everyone in that, in that church was a sinner. So why would anyone think we can work our way to the third heaven? And Paul says in Galatians 3, 2, This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you going to get to the third heaven by those works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Paul is basically saying to the Galatians, Let me ask you one thing. Did you get saved by doing those works of the law? Or did you get saved by faith? The reason he asked this is because just like some people believe they get saved initially by being a good person and doing good works, there are also people who teach you are saved by grace through faith without works, but then the works keep you. That was the Galatians' problem. They were bewitched into thinking the works were keeping themselves saved. So Paul calls them, oh, foolish Galatians. Someone who is relying on works to get to the third heaven is foolish. Galatians 3.3, 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? They began in the Spirit. When you get saved, the Spirit is the one that baptized you into the body of Christ. The Spirit is the one that sealed you into the day of redemption. That's when you began in the Spirit. And after salvation, you can choose to walk in the Spirit or you can choose to walk in the flesh. However, choosing to walk in the flesh, although that's a horrible decision, and that's awful that you would do that, it does not affect your salvation. It affects your testimony. It affects your rewards. It affects, affects your health and your life, your marriage. When it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, a Christian should be getting down to business. You should be working. However, when it comes to salvation, a Christian is sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When it comes to salvation, it's done. When it comes to my rewards, I need to be getting to work. When it comes to my salvation, I'm, it's done. I'm sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus said himself, it is finished, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. I'm all about getting to work for the Lord, but that work has nothing to do with my eternal destination. I'm not made perfect by the flesh, but I'm made perfect by the Spirit, and it's already made me perfect. It's already a done deal. Paul says, are you so foolish? It is a foolish thing to think that they could be kept saved by works when works couldn't get them the salvation to start with. So he asked them, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Can your sinful flesh make you more righteous than the blood of Jesus Christ has already made you? Think about that. You got the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your soul. Can your pathetic goodness that you do make yourself more righteous than the blood of Jesus Christ has already made you? When Paul plainly says, there is none righteous, no, not one. The thing that happens at salvation is Jesus Christ gives you his righteousness and he doesn't count any of your unrighteousness, any of the bad things you do to your record. Even the good things that a safe person may do, those aren't even counted to his record when it comes to him getting into the third heaven. They count for his rewards. They have to do with his discipleship, but they have absolutely nothing to do with his salvation. When, Jesus, when God looks at your uh, record up there in the file cabinet in heaven, he doesn't pull it out and see all the good things you've done after you got saved. He pulls it out and he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that when he pulls it out, it doesn't show the good things that I've done. 
because I can't never do enough good things to even keep myself saved. Jesus Christ keeps me saved. Here's what you should do. Draw a straight line for your life. Take a piece of paper. Draw a straight line on that piece of paper. Make that stand for your life. And in the middle of that line, draw a small vertical line and put under that line the day I believed on Jesus Christ. Then put a circle around that line, around that tiny little line. On the left side of the line, right before I got saved. On the right side of the line, right after I got saved. Now listen to this. When it comes to your salvation, all that comes into account is what's in that circle. All that matters is if, is if there was a time when you believed on Jesus Christ from the heart in that little circle. And write down the things you did before that. And... To the right side, write down what you did after. And then remember, point to that circle and say, this is all that matters. All these things I did before I was saved is a separate issue. All these things I did after I was saved is a separate issue. What you did after salvation is a discipleship issue. It is not a salvation issue. What you did before salvation is forgotten. And it couldn't stop you from getting saved. Salvation is not of works before salvation. And it isn't of works after salvation. In Galatians 3, 4, he says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Since they started out believing the gospel correctly, they did some suffering for preaching the truth. And Paul says some things that lets us know that men would add circumcision to the gospel so that they wouldn't have to face persecution for preaching salvation by grace through faith. And uh, see, the Galatians started out right. They weren't teaching circumcision and all that stuff to get to the third heaven, to be saved. So they were suffering persecution. So he's saying, have you suffered all that in vain? Now that you are believing works and faith, did you just suffer all that in vain when you were teaching the right gospel? In Galatians 6, 12, he said, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. See, if you add works to the gospel, you're going to be less persecuted because people love for you to say that they can play a part in their own salvation. That's how self-righteous people are. In Galatians 5.11, it says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. If circumcision and our works are added to it, then you're going to suffer less persecution. If the Galatians were right and works did keep them saved, then they suffered all of that persecution in vain when they were preaching the true gospel that works don't apply to your salvation. Galatians 3, 4, and 5, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The person that is ministering to them is the same one who bewitched them. In verse 1, notice it says he's working miracles. Miracles can be counterfeited by the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 shows he can perform signs and lying wonders. Revelation 13, 13 shows us he has the power to call down fire on the earth in the sight of men. And you saw what the devil did when the two magicians in the book of, with, with the two magicians in the book of Exodus and Simon the sorcerer bewitched the people in Acts 8, 9 through 11. And here's what they said about him in Acts 8, 10. They said, To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. How many times have you heard that? He's got the power of God as he preaches. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. you got to examine what he's saying. The Galatians had been bewitched by this man who came in telling them they were kept saved by faith and works. And Paul says in verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit. So this guy is a saved man with bad doctrine. He ministered to them the Spirit. 
But after that, he was teaching them they keep themselves saved. He was teaching them they're going to have to keep themselves saved to get to the third heaven. And heresies are a work of the flesh. According to Paul in Galatians chapter 5, bewitching someone and being bewitched is something a Christian's flesh could struggle with. So the Gala Paul's not saying the Galatians are lost. This is why Paul also calls witchcrafts a work of the flesh, which a Christian can commit. If you look at Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18, he says, But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Notice he is talking to Christians. A lost person isn't led of the Spirit. So Paul is explaining to them in Galatians chapter 5 that if they walk in the Spirit, then they aren't going to commit, commit the sins listed in verses 19 through 21 in Galatians chapter 5. However, they can walk in the flesh. So he says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, idolatry. Now look at this, witchcraft. The Galatians were bewitched. Some men were bewitching them. It doesn't mean they're lost. It means they're walking in the flesh. Adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, rash drafts, seditions, heresies. Heresies, it's a work of the flesh. It can be commit. This sin can be committed by a Christian. A Christian, a person can get saved, truly be saved. After they're saved, be taught wrong, get bewitched, and in turn bewitch others. Heresies, it's a work of the flesh. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't have any inheritance in the kingdom. They'll still go in the kingdom. They're still saved, but they're not going to inherit anything. So, these people bewitching them, it's possible that they're saved. And the Galatians who are bewitched, it doesn't mean that they're not saved. In Galatians 3, 5, he says, He therefore that ministereth you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So this man who bewitched the Galatians is a saved man with bad doctrine, and he's tricking them into thinking they are kept saved by the works of the law and not faith. And I believe there's plenty of saved men who believe you can lose your salvation and things like that. So this man who bewitched the Galatians is a saved man with bad doctrine. And he sa and Paul says in Galatians 3, 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham, one of the greatest examples. Abraham believed God. He didn't have a Bible. But if he did, he would be a part of a Bible-believing crowd. Because what did Abraham believe God about? He believed God about his seed. He believed God's words when they came to him. In Genesis 15, 5 and 6, it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Count the stars, what that means, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham wasn't looking, to the, looking forward to the cross. Abraham was believing God about his seed. And even in Romans chapter 4, it shows you exactly what Abraham was believing. In Romans chapter 4, 2 and 3, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What did he believe God about? Well, in Romans four thirteen, it says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his, to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And then in verse 18 in Romans 4, it says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Romans chapter 4 tells you what Abraham believed. Many people who say, well, Abraham was looking forward to the cross, and he got righteousness by looking forward to the cross. They'll use Romans 4 to teach that. But then in Romans chapter 4, the chapter they're using, it shows you 
what Abraham believed that got him righteousness. Abraham believed God about his seed. And for this reason, he was given imputed righteousness. This is a picture of how today we get imputed righteousness by believing on something. We get it through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says in Galatians 3, 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, imputed righteousness happens the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ. At that moment, the Lord gives you the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a sinless life. He fulfilled all righteousness. He has a perfect record and that record is given to you at salvation. And not only this, but your unrighteousness before and after salvation is not imputed to you. That's also in part of imputation. God doesn't even impute the bad things you've done to you. Romans 4, 6 and 4, 8. Even as David also described, describeth the blessedness of the man and whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So imputation has to do with the fact that if you're saved, you have the Lord's righteousness imputed to you, and also your sin is not imputed to you. This is why you can never lose your salvation. This is why you don't keep yourself saved. Jesus Christ did all the work in his life and then did the work on the cross by paying the penalty for sin so that you could accept the payment. Galatians 3, 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham? If you are saved, then you are a child of Abraham. And Galatians 3, 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Notice that the scripture is what preached the gospel to Abraham. At that time, Abraham did not have a Bible. Moses wrote Genesis, and Moses hadn't even been born when Abraham uh, believed on what God said. So the Lord is giving the scripture God-like attributes here. In Psalm 138, 2, it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. We don't worship the Bible, but the Lord puts his word up there very high. And Paul does a similar thing in the book of Romans when he's discussing Pharaoh who didn't have a Bible, and it says in Romans 9 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. So Paul's given the scripture some godlike attributes. He's saying the scripture was saying stuff before it was even pinned down, and he's saying the scripture could foresee some things. But this gospel preached to Abraham was not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel means good news. It means glad tidings. We have already talked about what the gospel to Abraham was. It was the fact that he would be the father of many nations. That was the gospel or glad tidings to Abraham. In Galatians 3, 8, it says, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, Jesus Christ will die on the cross for our sins and be buried and resurrect. No, that's not what it said. Let's read it again. Galatians 3, 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the good news to Abraham. Abraham was going to become a mighty nation. And the Lord told him, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And he told him in Genesis 18, 18, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now Galatians 3, 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Abraham got imputed righteousness and justification. And if you're a born-again Christian, then you also have both. And in Galatians 3.10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you aren't of the faith, like the people in verse 9, 
then you are of the works of the law. Like the people in verse 10, Paul says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. If you're of faith, you're not under the curse. If you're of the works of the law, then you're under a curse. You would have to do everything in the law with no slip-ups to get to the third heaven, to work your way to the third heaven. It says, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. It's much more than abstaining from murder and adul adultery and ad idolatry. I mean, you couldn't eat pork. You would have to keep the Sabbath. You couldn't pick up sticks on the Sabbath and all kinds of stuff. We aren't under the law. If we were, then we're under a curse. Nobody ever even kept the law perfectly. They would try their best to keep it and then offer the pres prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. And that was the only way any of them could be, according to the law, blameless. But when it comes to keeping the law perfectly, nobody did that. In Galatians 3.11, it says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. The just shall live by faith. If you are justified, then you have been declared righteous. The law doesn't declare you righteous. It actually does the opposite for every man that ever lived. It actually declares you guilty. In Romans 3.19, it says, Now we know that what, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And in Galatians 5, 4, Paul says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You can't be justified by the law. You must be justified by faith. Now, faith in what? Romans 5, 9, much more than being, just, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We're justified by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, shedding his blood. He was buried and resurrected. I'm believing on that to get me to heaven. Galatians 3.12, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So the law is not of faith. If you're trying to keep yourself saved, you're trying to work your way into the third heaven, trying to help the blood of Jesus out a little bit to get you up there by doing good things and by abstaining from bad things, then that isn't faith. You're trying to make it on your own because you don't think deep down that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Realize this, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all of your sins were in the future. He died for all those sins. Galatians 3.12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. If a man kept the law, he would preserve his physical life. And since his soul was stuck to his flesh in the Old Testament, it also affected his spiritual life. In the Old Testament, they were not sealed unto the day of redemption. They didn't have the spiritual circumcision. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ redeemed us. This means he bought us back. In Acts 20.28, 20, it says God purchased us with his own blood. He bought us. Uh, Jesus Christ was made a curse. He was made a curse for us. 2 Corinthians 5.12 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became the serpent on a pole for us. And John 3.14 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus Christ became the serpent on the pole when he hung on the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. We don't have to keep the law because Jesus Christ fulfilled it and then died the death, which was the penalty for every man who ever lived that broke it. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not only did Jesus Christ keep the law perfectly, he paid the penalty for breaking the law by dying on the cross for us. 
in Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus Christ made it possible for the blessing of Abraham to come on the Gentiles, the imputed righteousness and justification by faith. We receive these things through faith. Abraham is a great picture of our salvation, especially to the Galatians, because Abraham received imputed righteousness in Genesis 15 before he was circumcised in Genesis 17. The Galatians are needing correction. That circumcision has nothing to do with them getting imputed righteousness. So what better illustration can you give than Abraham who got imputed righteousness before he was circumcised? Galatians 3.15 Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Now he's going to give them a common il man's illustration. So he's speaking after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. This is the covenant to Abraham. And nothing can disannul it, meaning nothing can make it void or get rid of it. The Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. The Mosaic covenant was conditional on how they did Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So this is the spiritual seed. Galatians 3.17, This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise in effect. The covenant with Abraham was made before the law. So, and the law couldn't take anything from it or add anything to it. Paul says the covenant was confirmed before of God in Christ. Isaac represents Jesus Christ. He's a type of Jesus Christ there in the Old Testament. And the law was 430 years after the covenant with Abraham. So the covenant was made way before the law even came about. And Abraham got imputed righteousness by faith 430 years before the law. So why would it be far-fetched to think that we can get imputed righteousness without the law ourselves today? If Abraham got imputed righteousness 430 years before the law, then why couldn't we get imputed righteousness with the blood of Jesus Christ without the law today? It wouldn't be far-fetched because Abraham was given imputed righteousness without keeping the law. Abraham was given imputed righteousness without being circumcised. Galatians 3.18, For if the inheritance be of the law, is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. If the inheritance is of the law, then it would be of works. However, it is of promise. Our eternal life is an unconditional promise. Just like God's covenant with Abraham. Galatians 3.19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The law had to come about because under the covenant, Israel was living wicked and living in idolatry, and God had to set some boundaries. The law would be in effect until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The seed is Jesus Christ. John 1, 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person to keep the law perfectly. He's the reason that me and you would never have to keep the law to be saved. Jesus did all the work for us. Galatians three nineteen. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, which is Jesus. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The Lord gave Moses the law. Moses talked to the angel of the Lord. Moses met with God on Sinai. Moses then gave the law to the people. He was the mediator. Now today, we don't have a man as a mediator. Our mediator is the Savior himself. The Lord Jesus Christ is our mediator. Galatians 3.20, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. First Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 21, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, 
Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. The law isn't against the promises of God. God gave the law. It, it's a conditional covenant to keep men straight. God gave that unconditional covenant to Abraham. God gave the Mosaic covenant to keep people straight. Because the Israel was living in idolatry. They were doing wicked things. He had to set some boundaries. If the law could have given life, then there would have been no reason for Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Now Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ is given to them that will believe on him to be their Savior. You get the promise through faith. Galatians 3.23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Notice that phrase, before faith came. Of course, men had faith in the Old Testament, but this shows that we have, that what we have in the New Testament is a different kind of faith, even different than Abraham. Abraham believed God about his seed. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The men under the law were shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Very plain. They had no idea that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for their sins, be buried and resurrected. Abraham wasn't looking forward to the cross. He was looking forward to a kingdom. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And now this makes it very clear in 1 P uh, Peter 1, 10 through 12, showing you plainly that the very prophets themselves that wrote the prophecies about Jesus Christ didn't understand what they were writing didn't have it revealed to them. They didn't understand that Jesus Christ was going to come down the cross for their sins. They were looking for a king and a kingdom. They weren't looking for a crown of thorns. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you? They prophesied it. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now look at this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. They were shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Now it's revealed today. Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law brings you to Jesus Christ. Having a law lets you know that you can't keep the law. The law lets you know that you can't keep it. When you found out that you can't keep it then you find out you're a sinner and that you need a savior then you can believe on jesus christ and be justified by faith it was your schoolmaster galatians 3 25 but after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster now that i'm in jesus christ i'm no longer under the law if you reject jesus christ then you are still under the law and you would have to keep every bit of it to make it to heaven nobody ever kept the law perfectly they could try their best to keep it and then offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. And then they could be, according to the law, blameless. But when it comes to their entire life keeping every bit of it, nobody ever did that. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So I became a child of God at salvation. And John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The moment you believe, you are a child of God. The world thinks everybody's just a child of God, and all this, this isn't so. Before you believed, you were actually a child of the devil. Galatians three twenty seven. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Don't get this confused with water baptism. This is spirit baptism. The moment you believed on Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So the moment you believed, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. And this has nothing to do with water. Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In this body of Christ, we are one. In this body, you lose your national distinction. Remember, this chapter is about spiritual things. It's not about the physical things. It's not about Abraham getting physical land. We're not taking away Israel's land, you see. But we become the children of Abraham by faith. And we know this chapter is about spiritual things because even though we are in the body of Christ, when it comes to our physical body, we are still male or female. You're still whatever race you are physically. However, in Christ, you're none of that, and you're one with everybody else who's in Christ. If this chapter were about physical things, then what's Galatians 3.28 talking about? It says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. Well, physically, there is still male and female. You see, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Spiritually speaking is what this chapter is about. It's not talking about physical things. And that's where people get messed up. That's where the transgenders get messed up when they try to use this verse. They think that's talking about physical. No, this is spiritual. You still are whatever God made you physically. You're still a man if you were born a man. You're still a woman if you are born a woman. Uh, the promises to Abraham weren't talking about the physical promises of the land. We're not taking away the land from Israel. We didn't replace Israel. You see, everybody is getting messed up with this because they're forgetting this chapter is about spiritual things. The Campbellites, the Church of Christ, will come here and say that that baptism we just talked about, that's a, a physical water baptism. No, no, that's a spirit baptism where the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. And since it was spiritual, you didn't even see it happen when you got saved. It's a spiritual thing. Now, Galatians 3.29, And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Jesus Christ is the promised seed, and in Jesus Christ you are the spiritual seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. In the millennium, the Jews are going to get the land. There's going to be a remnant of believing Jews that go through the tribulation. They're going to go into the kingdom. Israel's going to get the land. We're going to have inheritance in the kingdom. But we do not replace Israel. You need to understand that. A lot of people will use this chapter to say, well, we've replaced Israel. We are the true children of Abraham. We became the children of Abraham by faith. But this doesn't do away with the physical promises. You see what I mean? It doesn't do it away with the physical land that they're going to get. But this has been Galatians chapter 3.